When it comes to working on pitch decks, we don't know what the f we're doing. This guy over here trying to study hard on the, the short, one short that we figured out. <laughs> Shut the f up. We worked at startups from the zero one stage, but we still don't got the hang of this shit yet. So we gotta figure out how the fuck do we get our ideas to sell? What are we looking at over here? Looking at Uber's pitch deck here. This is how they got funding from zero that zero to one stage. Some Helvetica font type shit. And we thought like, whoa, like do we gotta make this shit sexy or do we just gotta have a good idea? And you can do the 10 to 15 slides, but what else do you need to do? All right, what the even, what the, what the? <laughs> I don't know, I messed that up so easy. What the even heck is the pitch deck? All right, what's the number one solution if you got a problem and you gotta meet somebody and you have no connections? We doom scroll LinkedIn, that's what we do. And we found our boy Mark right here. When I hit him with the cold LinkedIn message, didn't expect him to respond, and he did. And so, meet the boys at Deck Doctor. So, a deck agency, does that sound right? Pitch deck agency? Yeah, we, they built a pitch deck agency that pretty much helps startups be able to storytell their ideas and get investment. Why these guys know their shit about storytelling for business startups is because they come from consulting and design backgrounds. So they know how to make shit uh, like that. Luckily, Mark and Alex want to hop on the podcast with us, so let's get into it. Come on. Hey, oh, we back at it again. Let's go, let's go. Another episode. What we what we at, Murph? Episode 10 now? We got, we kind of getting consistent with this shit. You feel Ooh, me? I don't even know. Episode 11? <laughs> All right, well, like you, like you guys heard in the intro, we brought our boys Alex and Mark. And funny thing, I want to tell this, like, I, re I re told it a little bit. I want to tell this funny-ass story. I hit up Mark telling him I was doom scrolling on LinkedIn. I honestly did not think he was going to respond. And I got clowned on so hard from everyone because they're like, bro, this guy is literally not going to respond to you. You sent the most informal <laughs> LinkedIn message ever. Um, but I appreciate you guys coming on, trying to share some knowledge. We're going to have some, just some <laughs> fun. Like, that's what, we, that's what we're here for. But... Murph don't really know about y'all too much. He just, honestly, yeah. let's keep it real. Murph just met you guys like, what, five minutes ago? <laughs> basically, <laughs> and then, basically. And so uh, give us a little rundown, you know, fill in Murph, fill in the whole audience, our family. You know, how did you all get into the pitch deck game? What was your guys' story? Uh, you know, I'll take, take whoever, whoever can take it off and start yeah. from here. Yeah. Uh, well, Thank you, man. Super pumped to be on. We uh, we're big fans of your guys. Maybe <laughs> maybe some of the biggest fans of this of this podcast out there. Honestly, um, yeah, dude, our so nice out, forty out... subscribers. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've like popped into most of the videos at this point. Um, <laughs> That's lit, dude. So Alex and I are high school friends. So we we've been friends now for like I don't know ten or twelve years, and maybe kind of similar to you guys, we were like fellow startup nerds in high school. So our first internship, Alex, our favorite t-shirt company, fired their college intern and hired Alex instead. And then Alex had me come to help him. And they paid <laughs> us and they paid us in t-shirts and had us work in like this sweaty room all day. And then we <laughs> stole a bunch of t-shirts at the end of the summer for revenge. Uh, oh, so, so, so I probably yeah, shouldn't I have said that. Oh, I should have said that on the, the internet. Story goes, the story goes even further back there, Mark, because how we got that internship was through Intrepid. Oh, we oh. We had Intrepid first, and then we parlayed that into the Jackson Jokers internship. So, so, so we made we made a t-shirt. I completely forgot. So, we, so Alex and I were friends. We made a t-shirt company. We forced our classmates to purchase the t-shirts. <laughs> and then we went to an actual legit fashion brand that we liked. And we're like, yeah, we have our own, t we have our own fashion brand. Like we should be your interns. <laughs> and honestly, they were like, yeah, we're going to have some college bum do it. Like you guys should join. <laughs> so instead they had like this underage labor that was Mark and Alex. And that was the beginning of our work, our work life together. But um, Alex, I'll let you pick up the baton. We had a couple different ideas. I think we were going to do like this babysitting technology so we were doing some school. crazy, crazy shit in high school. And then, <laughs> and then we coincidentally, totally coincidentally, uh, went to college together. So we got into the same school. We went, we, uh, and we just like, you know, stayed close, um, always had different ideas that we were just tinkering with throughout college. And then again, into our professional careers, I think, you know, we, we, we kind of jetted off into different directions where I went into yeah. like a traditional kind of management consulting role at Accenture. Mark was doing a lot cooler work than I was at the time working at RGA doing creative and innovation consulting. And, but, you know, I think 
that was a time for us to just like get into the professional world. I didn't really do any internships in college. So I was like, let me just get like a good little thing on my resume. And throughout that time, we just kept talking, we kept having different ideas. We each then kind of jetted off to another similar time, actually jetted off to another role that was a little bit more each of us following our passions. So I was, I was really into crypto. I was really into startups. And so I worked at this kind of <laughs> blockchain is like a late mid stage blockchain startup doing uh, what was called venture development, essentially just like an accelerator program out of this startup that I was working okay. at. So that's where I got like the real experience working with founders, working with VCs um, and just like kind of, you know, understanding that world a lot more. Mark went and did, well, I'll let Mark kind of tell his, his own side of the story. But throughout that time, we, we really started ramping up our ideas. We had, Mark was thinking and, through. And I'll, I'll interject. This is yeah, because jump, we were jump in. becoming unhappy with our jobs. So, so we were like, in these, so we had both jumped jobs that we realized we we're not going to stay at. And then we're like, you know, back on the grind, like it was freshman year of high school, like, all right, what are we making? What are we making? Yeah. And it was yeah. one of the ideas. It wasn't even, we didn't do anything with it at first. One of the ideas was deck doctors. Okay. So I think, you know, I was like, that makes sense. It's a good idea. Nothing really happened. And then kind of had a funny moment where I had a friend ask me for help with a pitch deck and I looped Alex in and we like completely failed to give useful advice on the pitch deck. It was terrible. <laughs> um, but suddenly we were like, Alex afterwards, like just made a website. And then I'm like, wait, you actually made a website for, for the pitch deck thing. And yeah. he's like, yeah, like let's call it deck in a box. And I was like, we can't do that. Like, we're going to get in trouble. We're going to get arrested. Oh my God. I'm not going to lie. That's the worst name. I yeah. So, so yeah, I think so, it's so, the so. best name. Because at the time, at the time, I was yeah. like, it's, it's, that's, I was like, that's going to strike a chord with people. Someone's going to see that in would have had no business. It, we would have been <laughs> like, hilarious. it's like a, pre, it's a predatorial name. <laughs> it it but, was provocative. But it kinda, it's provocative. Just looking at your reactions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I guess they did what you wanted it to do, man. Like you're just like, I just be like deck in the box. Like <laughs> in retro, in retrospect, it would have changed the course of our entire careers if we called it deck in the box. Because there's absolutely no way that we would have the credibility that we have today with that name. Um, so oh it, was, it was honestly the name is an interesting. It's interesting how impactful the name has been, I think, for us as well. Because at that time, the, the, the insight at when we were starting it was like, we had all these ideas uh, right around that time when we were both like checked out of our jobs. And a lot of the ideas required us to build out some technology, raise some funds, kind of do a traditional startup. And we got kind of far and then we, you know, kind of saw this Deck Doctors thing, at least at the time, as an opportunity to literally just make a our first dollar tomorrow, yeah. you know? And I think that's like, some people get wrapped up in these like elaborate ideas that, you know, seem pretty far off and then they get kind of far and then they don't, you know, kind of make that first dollar. And we were like, if we set up a website for this and we get a client, there's no cost. It's just our time. We're going to figure yeah. it out, but we can make, we can make a dollar tomorrow. And so that's, that's kind of how it started, you know? Um, and then I, I, after deck in a box, failed the mark uh vetting process we came up with deck doctors it was you, like the you did first the letter Al alex had the best the best and the worst <laughs> alex named yeah. deck doctors. but it was it was a very it was, i sat down to do the website and i was like it just came to me and i was like all right that's an alliteration and it kind of makes sense let's do it and then the very first real client that we had was like said to us when i heard the name deck doctors i knew that's what we needed and so I was like, all right, we're the deck doctors from now on. Uh, as silly fine. as it sounds, it was, uh, it, it just like worked and it's continued to work. So, um, that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. I mean, honestly, I gotta, I gotta respect the fact that y'all were just like two youngins that just were like, all right, it's like, screw it. Like we about to just go ball out, make something and see what happens. Because I feel like a lot of people don't, they don't, they don't take that leap just because they feel like they got to be in that traditional sense. And also Alex, like I was an intern at Accenture. Nah, that's, yeah, that's, that's I, I not it. funny. <laughs> I, hated, I hated it there. But the thing is, that's where I got. So I, basically my entire job was formatting PowerPoint slides and yeah. I hated it. But then I was now in retrospect, I was like, if I didn't, if I wasn't like a pretty 
pretty much a savage at PowerPoint slides, we wouldn't be here today. So it's like, you know, <laughs> as much as much as the the time, yeah, it, it wasn't fun. But you look back and you're like, you know, I, I got a good skill well, out of it. It was so. a great experience that I got as well. It was, hey, but you know, I I learned so much, so I'm so thankful for that. But I, now we want to be able to transition to something. You, I know, Mark, out of Mark's request, he said he wanted to change it up a little bit. And so we're, we're going to do we're going to do rapid fire questions. Y'all got 90 seconds to answer. And we're going we're gonna to put a timer on and everything. 90-ish. We'll, we'll, we'll keep 90, we'll, 90-ish. We'll, be a little, we'll be a little soft about the the, the ending. Uh, uh, Ahmed's not going to make like an alarm noise and just end. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to I'm just gonna scream into the mic. <laughs> 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 yeah, we're just going to go rip it off. Uh, Murph, you want to yeah. start it off? Like, and we want to learn as much as we can from pitch decks because, bro, we know jack shit because we were trying to make the pitch deck before this for you guys to show to talk to you guys about how we're trying to sell all yeah. caps and man we were struggling bro i remember like murph was like oh i'm so tired bro i don't think i could look at the screen anymore and i was, yeah. like, I was like yeah man this 10 minutes that we've been into doing this is 10 hard minutes in, yeah <laughs> okay let's run it uh we're gonna start easy but what percentage do you guys think the founders get pitch decks wrong how do you define wrong <laughs> just like make just like, made a mistake you just look at it and you're like, man, this is not even a pitch deck. Like they, they need some work on their storytelling. They need some work. A very high percentage, I will say that. <laughs> I think, uh, I mean, it's it's all it's all subjective, right? Like I think, you know, you can, and we could talk a little bit about what the pitch deck is, but it, it, in many ways, it's just an asset that's supposed to tell your story. So in some ways, there's no wrong answer, but in many ways, there's Oh, you know, kind of different strategies that we use and that people should use to optimize for the intended outcome that they want to have. And so I would say, you know, most of the founders we work with are very smart. They're very talented at building technology or selling, you know, a product, but, you know, dumbing it down and, you know, delivering that pitch to an investor takes like a very specific lens. And I think a lot of people struggle with it. So, I, you know, herein lies yeah. the, uh, the opportunity or the market for deck doctors. Another another frame there. Am I allowed to share the question? Or go, ahead, just, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. No, yeah, an- is another just, frame is there is like, is um, what percentage are not optimal or not optimized? Mm, and I think okay. that's like a better, maybe a better question because I'd say like, that's the truth. It's like five percent come in or or two percent, and I'm like, that's optimized. Like, don't you know you don't you don't need anyone. You don't just yeah. need that. Like, you just don't need any. You don't need to touch it. Like, it's an A plus. Okay. But then it's like, I almost would give it a grade and say like, we want every pitch that we work on to be an A plus. So <clears> how many come in at the A plus level, like 2% or maybe 5% max, probably 2%. There's like 50% that are like Fs. And it's like, this, this, <laughs> this is, this is completely, completely, maybe not even salvageable. Yeah. Uh, yeah but then, yeah. yeah, you know, then most of it's like a, like whatever, a distribution, like some people have Cs, people have Bs. A lot of times people come to us and they have like a B plus, A minus, I'd say pretty common someone comes in and like they have a lot of pieces there but like you know there's it's still worth doing the work to go from a b plus to an a plus so maybe that's another framing yeah and so i won't lie i believe the art of pitch decks is crucial but i was talking to a founder uh not too long ago and he was telling me like oh bro pitch decks doesn't matter if you got a good (laughs) idea like you that's all you need bro put the (laughs) times new roman on that shit and you you can sell anything um, yeah. but like, how do you guys feel the aspect of design and storytelling really goes into play and why is there this kind of like, if your idea is so good, then you don't need a pitch deck. Like, do you guys believe in that kind of philosophy? We love this question. I honestly think if you had like the ultimate product and like you, and it was patented or something, you don't need a deck. Like okay. if you actually hit someone with like the clearest billion dollar opportunity ever, and you already were making a lot of money or something <laughs> like you don't need a deck. You just need to say, Hey, I'm making 20 million, like, and, and you know, give me a little bit more money so we can easily make. So, but, but that's not going to happen. That's not real life. I think like what's more realistic is, you know, no one's going to have that. And if anything, most people have like the same ideas. Like we've worked with 50 generative AI companies in the past year, uh, many in the same industries. So what the reality is, is not that anyone has the best pitch. It's that everyone actually has very similar concepts. So what ends up making a company win or lose is execution. And one of the ways you can signal execution to an investor is having everything not just be well-written and well-explained, but be like immaculately designed. Like that's another Mm. way of just showing someone, hey, we're the top of 
top of the stack when it comes to how we're doing things here, because we care about your attention and your time. And we're going to make sure everything we explain to you is going to be visual and digestible. We're not going to make you waste any time trying to understand what we're trying to explain. Like the thing you, in order to understand, understand the answer, you have to understand like the intended outcome of a pitch deck, the pitch deck, you know, you, you're looking to raise cap. Typically it's a fundraising pitch deck. You're looking to raise capital from investors. And those investors are looking at many, many different companies at a given point. So if you're an early stage investor, you can have the best like idea hundreds. ever. Uh, you give the best idea ever, but in order to get in the door and get their attention, they need a, that, that needs to resonate in a pitch deck form because that's the first entry point into somebody's just awareness of you, of you as a company and you as a, a concept. So if they're looking at hundreds of pitch decks a month and you have a shitty pitch deck, but like the best idea of all time, they may not, you know, give you much more than 15 seconds before saying this team looks unprofessional or, you know, I yeah. don't, I don't quite get it. I don't get what, I don't get the idea. So it's, it's, you know, it's an important concept. And even as you get later stage, uh, the one thing I'd say is you don't really need a, a pitch deck if you just have a killer, you know, killer traction and killer product market fit and people are just clamoring at the door for an investment in you. But very few companies are in that, in that place. And even at the later stage, you could have great traction, but you need to convince somebody to take the meeting. You need to equip them with something that they can, you know, share on your behalf. So it's important in a lot of ways just because, you know, it's, it's there to do work for you when you're not there, basically. Yeah. Um, well, so, yeah. What if I had the most goaded demo video? Does that mean, like, you know, like, can, can that out, uh, like, outplay a pitch deck? Like, if, especially when you were talking about, uh, like, AI companies. If I can get a, a fire demo video, do you think yeah. that will get me in the door? Or do you think that still we need to have the storytelling aspect to t discuss the problem? So I, I think the demo video covers, like, a third of what's in a pitch deck. Like in a pitch deck, you have like an opportunity that you set the pitch up with. You then have a product, which is how you're solving the thing. It's your answer. And then you have a vision. So the demo video, if it was amazing, would do a great job at explaining everything about the product, but it's not gonna really nail like the market opportunity and what the competitors are doing in the market. Like it'd be weird to mention a bunch of competitors in a demo video. And it's also not gonna talk about like growth plans or you know go to market and stuff. So like a great demo video would get you like a third of the way there, but then like investors still need all three things. So you're telling me I can't just send a vlog to these, to A16Z, just be like, hey, what's up you guys? You know, this is my company, day in the life. <laughs> I mean, if you sent a really funny <laughs> vlog, like I actually think it's most okay, like a free pre-seed or idea stage. Really? Like, okay, okay. Like, you know, if you don't have anything and you just have an idea, then yeah, like, you know, say what's up. That makes sense. But if, yeah. if, you, if you have traction, like, you know, you might want to explain it in depth. <laughs> but I mean, but in my opinion, those days of like getting your idea funded are like long gone. Like, I feel like, I, I don't know, at least in my opinion, like in you guys, I want you all to hit, like, you know, come back at me with some heat if you believe otherwise. But I feel like nowadays, like you have to have some sort of traction, at least a little bit of traction to even get your pitch deck looked at. Yes, I think good, the good market... Point. Yeah, I think it's a good point. I think the market has obviously changed and we've seen it change a little bit in the two years that we've uh, been at this. So I do think, you know, unlike 2022, when there was a lot of, you know, capital flying around, um, more recent times is definitely valuing how do we de-risk this with some sort of traction, but there's a massive market of pre-seed investors that are investing in ideas. Um, and the traction that they look for is, can be as simple as just customer interviews. Do you actually understand who you're working with? Uh, you know, any, any sort of, you know, do you have an initial product? Like, you know, traction is pretty broad when it comes to pre-seed investing and pre-seed investors are still deploying capital today. So, you know, in a lot of ways it's, it's you know, you, that whole market's still there, but you know, they want to show, you, you need to kind of show that you're vetting the idea in some way and that can be kind of construed as traction. So. I don't know if that helps, but, um, but yeah, I think, I think ideas, ideas can get funded, but you got to put a little meat on the bone. I yeah. want to uh, jump to something else, but let's put our like pre-seed seed, uh, investing stage, like hats on how, how honest should founders be in their pitch deck? How much of their business, like details and statistics should they be including, but also like at the same time, trying to hype it up to investors, um, when they're in that meeting room, I feel like that can be a challenge. There might not yeah. be some things that necessarily the founder wants to share. 
you know, kind of put like kick the can down the road a little, the road a little bit. What do you guys think about that? I got a strong opinion about this too that I want to tap in after y'all. I mean, I I would say we've seen so many pitch decks, and there's in general under hyping going on. Mm. People, I think, are scared to hype themselves up, and obviously, like if you have some bad metrics, I would never lie. So first of all, you can't lie in a pitch. Yeah, that's just crazy. (laughs) <laughs> you can choose what metrics to include. It's fraud. So like you can put in the better metrics and not include the bad ones. Someone will maybe find them out down the road if they go deeper into diligence. But like in general, as far as how you're talking about yourself, like you need to be your own biggest hype man. Because oftentimes like, you know, n- no one's just going underst- to understand why you're dope off that. So I think, I think I, ger- I, I, barring lying, I think like we are in the business of helping people hype themselves up and like, the hype is real or it should, it should, it should be. <laughs> so why I don't do know. Think, I, I want to know where Ahmed goes. Why do you think they're under hyping it? That's so, that's so interesting. Like if you're not passionate about what, like what you're building, like how are yeah. you expecting to get other people excited that's the about same it? Question I have, because I feel like when you are obsessed about something, you want to hype it up as much as possible. But I could also see what you mean by the fact that they don't want to overvaluate themselves and end up like, you know, well, getting well, their ass kicked. I, 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 I think there's something very scary that happens when you're in the trenches of your business, which is like when you're in the idea stage, it's really easy to hype. But like once you've been building something for two years, like almost everyone we worked with has horror stories, like a moment where they almost ran out of money or like a competitor came and like took their first idea. So then they had to change their ideas. So I just feel like being in startup creation is such a humbling, consistently humbling thing that yeah, it's easy to be hype if you're like coming out of college and you have a dope idea, but like you're gonna six months in trying to, you know, like you're just, it's, it's everything about it kicks your ass. So I don't know. I, I actually don't know why people are less naturally hyped. Um, I'm really curious Alex's thoughts, but it's it's definitely what we see. So I'm not like making it up. It's just uh, I, I agree with what you guys are saying. People should be hyped. Because okay, so this is my like my opinion generally about how not just hype, but like. Also, how you should convey your startup, right? I was talking with Murph about this and I was basically saying like, it's, I think it's fine if you put something like, oh, we missed these kind of targets, but this is how we're fixing it. This is what we're doing yeah, to fix it. This is, this is the traction is that great. we're doing. It. Because I feel like if you're straight up self-awareness, then that off the rip is going to create a good relationship with the investor. Yeah, that's 100%. like, that's, that's my experience so far because I've had people I've had, you know, I, I'm tapped in with a lot of builders in my, in the Seattle ecosystem. And they will hide some things. They'll be like, oh, yeah, there's this competitor, but I'm not too worried about it. Or I'm not too worried about this. I'm not too worried about that. So I'm not going to add it. And I'm like, no, nah, like tell them what it's, yep. that it's there and then be able to be like rebuttal it. Because then eventually it's going to be awkward of being like, OK, why'd you miss this? Why'd you miss this? Why'd you miss this? When they went deeper in the due diligence and you're just saving yourself that 100%. whole awkward conversation by just saying like, here, bro, like this is where we're not fucking winning and this is how we're going to win. And it's like, exactly. I don't know. That's like, I don't know. That's how I really, I'm super passionate about it. But, but, but don't you see why, why maybe that could make it harder to hype yourself up? Because I feel like yeah. it's like, mm-hmm. it's like we got a tension here, I think, which we should talk about. It's like the tension between honesty and self-awareness and then the tension between, you know, I, I don't know, Alex, where does your head go? I think this is something we deal with all the time. And we, we even talked about it in our ebook. I think it's, it's, uh, it's just the concept that vulnerability leads to trust. And I think at the end of the day, you want to, you have to build trust. You can't detract from trust. One of the things that detracts from trust is imagine you're talking to a salesperson, they're overselling you, they're overhyping something. You you have that immediate guard that, you know, this is too good to be true. Or, you know, this guy is, this guy's trying too hard. I'm not going to trust what they're saying. And if you lose trust at all about one thing in the pitch deck, then you lose trust about basically everything else you want to say. And you, you kind of lost the game. So I think, you know, it's, there's a balance between overselling and underselling. And I think that's why a lot of people default to underselling is they you yeah. kind of want people to see the, see the world the same way that they do without having to sell it too hard. But exactly as you guys have said, if you, if you can be, if you have something to be vulnerable about, they're going to find out about it anyway. So you may yeah. as well be upfront about it because that, that may, that enhances your trust here. And then when you're making a claim about your business model or something later in the deck, now they've already trust you. And, uh, you know, that, that claim is taken a lot stronger. So 
I think we're uh, I think we're all on the same page here. I'm curious if you know this is like a clear mistake that founders can make. But have you guys made a mistake like that at all in like selling yourselves or like what what's your biggest mistake so far two years into the journey? We've made a lot <laughs> of mistakes, I will say. Um, maybe regrets. But I, maybe regrets. I think the then. funny thing is the funny thing is I think the way I'm curious Mark's take, but I think that like we've we've never. I really don't think we've ever tried to oversell ourselves because at the end of the day, it's an important decision for a founder to make. And again, it's just part of our ethos and part of the way that we build our business and do business development is that, you know, people come to us, we tell them what problems we can solve for them, uh, given the experience that we continue to grow. So, you know, I I don't think we've ever oversold and had that been a mistake. Um, Mark, where does your head go? I mean, thinking about ourselves, I feel like we strike a cool balance where like you go on our website, the first thing you'll see is we build the best decks. And then when we actually talk to people, sometimes we'll be like, yeah, we don't even think we should take on your deck. Like you should go work with a different type of party on this. So I feel like maybe that's like part of the answer is like high level, like the vision and your mission, you need to be hype and you need to not be afraid to say it. But then like when it actually comes down to like the, the tactical details, like we're all about telling the truth. And I think we ended up winning business. Whenever we tell someone they should not work with us, like we almost always work with that person. It's the funniest thing. Uh, so I think there's something to be said for that. Like I, I see the self-awareness work out, but as far as like mistakes we've made, I think um, trying to do everything ourselves for too long. That's that. That's probably the Definitely. biggest mistake. Yeah. Like the best, best thing ever is to work with cool people. So we, we waited a little bit too long to, to hire people, but that's a small mistake, I guess. Dude, I, I I love the the authenticity of like being like, oh yeah, I don't think we we're, we're a good fit for that. And I think that's like that's where people are like, all right, if this guys if these guys can say that, then like we can trust them. Like we can we're not getting sold something or we're not doing all that. And that's all like, yeah. I mean, honestly, like that's how I feel when I meet anybody. Like when I met you, like I didn't I didn't like I loved I wanted you guys to come on the podcast, but that wasn't <laughs> my initial like my thought. I was like, I just want to meet someone cool, and then it just kind of flourished that relationship flourished from there. And I was like, I think it's so important for people to not think about it in a transactional manner. And it really frustrates me because I face this a lot in the startup world, especially being like a young guy, just trying to be scrappy that like, if I like tell them like, you know, Oh my, Oh, here's all my background. They're like, Oh, okay. Then that's cool. Like, let me talk to you. Let me get some advice. But if I don't say anything, I'm just like, Hey man, I'm just interested in being a friend. They're just like, nah, I'm not really interested. And I'm like, okay, well then I'm going to find the people that are just interested in being friends. And it's just kind of like, Man, that's just such yeah. a great tactic to find deep relationships. I mean, that's reverse a, psychology. That's a whole other chat. Weird. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I, I, reverse I, psychology I, is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got that crazy ADHD, so I'm bouncing around like a million miles per hour everywhere. <laughs> it's, it's a superpower, dude. It's a superpower. Okay, I wanna, I wanna tap into like, kind of the go-to solution that you guys go with at Deck Doctors, because I'm. It's probably dependent on, you know, the startup that you're dealing with, but I'm interested in how you guys like to storytell companies just in general. Like, do you like to tell it from a beginning, middle and end and the climax being the solution or should the solution be coming first? What's kind of like the framework? And, you know, it could depend on the industry in general, you know, depending on what's hot now, um, what's not. But I'm curious about the go-to frameworks you guys like to share with people that uh, with startups that you guys work with. If you can kind of give a little insight on that, Alex, you wanna you wanna say it? I, I've, ta- you gotta, I've said you gotta this. Take, you gotta take it away. This oh, is your okay, pitch. Okay. This is your elevator pitch right now. Like how how Dude, <laughs> how Mark, do you pitch Mark, a startup? Mark does this. Mark does this before every workshop, and he does it so well. Uh, I gotta <laughs> I gotta pass it to you, my friend. Uh, I'm not. I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'm not gonna. Song. I'm not going to do the full thing. I was just laughing because I've literally, we we talk about this a lot. So um, yeah, man, I think broadly speaking, there's a beginning, middle and end. We call the beginning, the opportunity setup. We call the middle, the product or solution. And we call the end, the vision. Uh, We think every deck should start with a hook. You need to grab someone right away and you need to say something that's unique to you. So it could be traction. It could be that your team is dope. Maybe like something crazy happened and that's why you started the company, like put that first, get someone invested or even just say a crazy statement that someone's never seen before and get them interested right off the bat. 
Um, then like every deck should move, in my opinion, to a problem slide. I think investors want that little beat of storytelling. And then we're less interested in the problem, which ideally like mentions a market size. It's a big problem. And we're more interested in the gap. So like after a problem, we want a gap. Like why is that mm. problem not solved is more important to us than the problem itself. And this is often a really organic way to bring competitors into a pitch. So you hook someone in, you explain the market, the issue in the market, and then it's like, well, here's why, the, like, here's the, this is why it's not been solved. And hopefully at that point, the narrative has momentum. And no matter what, there's going to be like an inevitability. Oh, all right, there's this gap. Well, someone needs to fill the gap. And then boom, you come in as, this, as the solve. So whenever we shift to the next section and talk about someone, we always have something called a one-liner. We think like every pitch needs to pivot the conversation with like a super simple slide that just says what the product is. So we'll have a one-liner explain what the product does. Then we go into what we call the deep dive section. This is like the most flexible of the sections in a pitch. And it includes like details around value propositions, how the product works, business model, kind of some of the more uh, like more rigorous materials. And we purposely put that in the middle because that might be like a little bit of an emotional lull in the journey of the pitch. And then we mm -hmm. want to kind of slingshot out of that with something that we call a gut punch. So if the hook is like something to get people interested in the opportunity, the gut punch is like something sick about your product. You have some moat, you have some differentiation, you have some distribution advantage. Like there's some channel that you're in like Walmart gave you an agreement for 50 years to only sell your brand of something. Like something like that is a really good gut punch. And then that basically sets you up for the vision. Uh, and the vision is all about instilling credibility. So one thing we'll say is like, if the opening is logical, there's this hole in a market and the product section is emotional, like you've built something super special. Um, we used to say this, we don't say that as much anymore. Um, then like the ending, which we totally still agree with is credibility building. So that's where you gotta discuss traction, go to market plan, like how you're going to market, what are the different markets you'll attack over time. Uh, oftentimes the fundraise goals and why you're raising money come into the vision. And then the team is like a great final note of credibility, but dude, the team, the team can move around, the team can really go wherever. So that's like the framework if there was one, but we always preface that by saying like, we're gonna break this. And we always will break this. <laughs> so it's just kind of like a good way of interviewing people. And like most decks will follow many or all of those story beats. And our just whole approach has been like, let's think about the framework as a story and not as like, oh, you need a traction slide or, oh, you need a competitor slide. Like, let's talk about it as like story elements. So that's something mm. we're just really, we really believe is important, even if the content is totally about the business. That's like yeah. two years of overthinking this shit into a, <laughs> into, into a framework. Well, uh, I'm glad you were able to break that down because now let's let, let, let's let the, let, let all of our fam be able to see our pitch deck that we made in 10 minutes before this call. So, uh, Murph, show that, show that shit yeah. up, pull it up, pull it up. We're going to play it. And, um, uh, oh my God, I, we never rehearsed this. So you guys are going to be our first people that we're doing this and it's going to be ugly real quick. I just have cause... very low expectations. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dang. Uh, that already, hurt a so, already, <laughs> already a drop shot. All right. All right. All right. Are, are oh, you ready? Looks sick. This looks sick. Are you, are you ready? Is this, is, this, is this the demo vid? No, just no, going... no. It's just nah. the slide. It's just a slide. The like, demo vid would just be me and Ak yelling at each other, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Are you really ready? Because we're going about to knock your socks off. This is next slide. Next slide. Next slide. How did you make this? <laughs> All caps capital, best podcast anyone will excuse. <laughs> so good, knock your socks off. Literally, will I promise? All right, so that's that. That's it. No, I'm just playing. We're gonna, we got like the actual shit. <laughs> we'll run through this. We'll run through this. <laughs> you got the deck doctors on, so now the claims can be substantiated. <laughs> yeah. So basically. <laughs> This is so bad. We literally, I can't believe we only did this in 10 minutes. We should have definitely spent more time on this. But go on the next slide. Our goal and our vision with all caps is to create a community that empowers underdogs, curious, and young innovators, providing them resources to break into the industry patterns and create impactful startups. Basically, what we're doing, like ourselves, is that we're climbing from zero to one together and building a future led by diverse voices and innovation. 
So like that's kind of like what our like North Star, what we're trying to do. But how do we win in this? There's so many goddamn business podcasts out there. Murph, tell them how we're gonna win. <laughs> So we are we are our tar- target audience. So we're going to be building alongside that community and hoping like just form really cool connections with a shared passion around startups. And so and and if you think about this, right, we want to build a, we don't want to just build a podcast. We want to build a community from the grassroots out. Right. Where it starts with us engaging every day with the community, interacting, giving our feedback doing whatever we can sharing what we're building on the side because we build random little side projects on the side um but then how are we going to do this what is our like growth like we're, how are we going to get this community together so this is this is the content the juicy shit all right go to the next slide go to the next slide <laughs> short form concept we don't want the traditional b-roll shit bro we want we want some real stuff right there okay so it, let's go to the next slide go to the next house and we don't want the traditional podcast interview experience like we want to make this shit fun as fuck all right next slide next slide chasing trends like my mom told me don't chase girls and i do that a lot but i'm not gonna chase trends and because it's unsustainable so next slide next slide next slide so our solution <laughs> create our own style in the business podcast world like this is revolutionary this is this yeah you gotta you got a typo you gotta typo <laughs> Our solution. Oh, bro, I told this there guy. Right? That's why you get paid the big bucks, Mark. I, 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 Caught I, I, that I, right off the bat. To say it was right, purposeful. It's a, it's a play on words. Yeah, yeah, the soul. Soul. That's soul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll underline no, that. We purposely did that. We purposely did that. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. What are we going to do? Goofy, authentic hits. That's what we're going to produce every fucking day. Give the most raw, authentic storytelling. Fuck being polished. Excuse my language. Excuse my French. And we want bloopers. We want everything. We want all the. You know what? That typo was was for real, Mark. You know, don't don't shit on my typo right there. <laughs> Some respect on that typo. <laughs> and then the next slide. That shit. So what we want? We want to learn. We want learning to be unintimidating. Learning to be fun and learning to be and to learn with everyone. And that's all caps for you. That was Thanks. the worst pitch ever. <laughs> I felt the energy. I felt the energy. I let you yeah, take yeah. that. I let I was, you take that all away. Yeah, let the crowd be screaming for me. There, there's a crazy, <laughs> a crazy moment like halfway through that you just were on it, bro. I was like, I don't know what you're pitching, but I want in. <laughs> nah, at the end of the day, we do want to talk about like how can we really pitch, you know, this this community, these people like we want to be able to provide as many resources as possible. Our goal is to just build with everyone. And just make the shit like enjoyable, like and and be as authentic as possible. So like any feedback, what's up? We want to get a feedback. How we can make this better? Make this goofier? Make this more close to our ethos? Anything? Let, let's focus on the pitch because yeah, we can focus, focus on, on a lot you, on what we're doing. But let's focus <laughs> on just like the pitch. Like what other things could would you guys have liked to see included or anything? They're probably not like necessarily that we're trying to get investors, but just like in <laughs> general, like think if sentence. we were. Dog shit. That's what they're thinking. <laughs> honestly, no. Honestly, I, I mean, the it, the delivery I think is uh, is impossible not to capture the energy, and I feel like that's uh, that's definitely going for you. I uh, and I and I and I de- definitely I think part of the reason why when Mark sent me you guys this thing or your YouTube, I was like, let's definitely do this, is because you guys are authentic and you're you you have a different perspective and you have a different uh voice and you know I, I love the fuck being polished it's actually amazing <laughs> copywriting because in it you know you're you're in yeah, it you're yeah. you know not being polished with that sentence and it's an amazing line so i think you did a lot of cool things and i have i do have a few things i would uh i would add <laughs> so my my the, the immediate thing is like i'm sold on you guys i'm sold yeah. on the solution yeah but exactly what i'm missing is why does the world need this? What's the gap? Yes. What's the problem? Mm. And problems and gaps are basically how we communicate demand for something. Yes. So it's like, yeah, we want to have this different voice. We want to we want to kind of take this different approach. But does the world want this? And that's kind of what, you know, oh. the whole point of a problem and gap is in a pitch deck mm. is you got to right. signal that there's going to be demand for this. And I think you guys can. I mean, it's not like you can't. It's just that you didn't. Uh, yeah. Yo, so I, I, I think that's like number one first thing I would think about. All right. So I, that's exactly where my head went, and I've been thinking a lot about this. I feel like so. Oh, this is really interesting. So the first thing I'll say is like you have this trend that was well known that 
entrepreneurs come from all different backgrounds. Mm-hmm. And like almost every VC we work with are looking for diverse perspectives because it literally increases the chance of success of a startup. Like foreign founders are more likely to have successful startups than US-based founders, for example. Mm. So it's almost like there's like this, this interesting disconnect where we know the entrepreneurs are literally coming from everywhere. But then we look at like the content and the education and it's all one note. It's like all the same looking dudes, all the same long form, boring ass formats. And the next generation of kids that are trying to come from everywhere, like that's like, there's basically this disconnect. You have this content that's catering to like a small percentage of the overall pool of entrepreneurs. And then it's like, well, what do people actually crave? Like, and then it could just maybe be, then it's like, you know, the, the youth of today, which we are, need X, Y, and Z. They need stuff that's authentic, that's not dumbed down, but is stated in plain language. Like, they just don't need people, like, sucking each other off on podcasts for an hour. They need, like, <laughs> something that's entertaining. Like, if it's not fun, they're not going to watch it. So it's like, all right, like, we're having shit that's, like, we, like and then it's like, then, then that sets you up. So I don't know, man. I mean, I, 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 my head went exactly where Alex went. And then I'm thinking about how do I, like, prove the demand? The demand is proven by the fact that like unicorns are literally created by the most random people ever of all economic backgrounds, all racial backgrounds. We know that, you know, there's a crazy spectrum of people making startups, but then like, why is every startup podcast exactly the same? Well, boom, we need a new way in that can like hit the, the, the 80%, the 90% that's been untouched. Now that's us. Yeah. That's us. Yeah. Say Take that. Notes. Word. Say that. <laughs> Take notes. Holy shit. Yeah. Or like, I think we've been struggling kind of how to convey this to a lot of people, especially when we're trying to bring different people onto the podcast and stuff like that. It's been very hard to say like what problem we're trying to solve. Like we get that question all the time. It's like, how are you any different than anyone else? And when we say this authenticity and this goofiness, I think it's a lot of the, more established people and older folks typically are kind of like geared away from it. They're like, Oh, that's a little, like, that's a little much for me. But then I feel like it's the younger entrepreneurs. The ones that we're trying to target are like very enticed to it. The way you could get the older folks in though, is showing them why, you know, they should be appreciating that you could say, look, like your content's only reaching a fraction of the potential audience it could reach because there's all these people who'd be interested in what you do, but like, you're not explaining it. You're not going on platforms that they care about. So quickly there, my head goes to like, and it's a build off of what Mark was saying, but it's like, can we do some sort of kind of historical analysis, maybe back 25 years? And we mm. look at the trends, we look at the, the media enterprises that were built uh, from like grassroots. And there's, there's countless examples of this um, and kind of make a point that the, 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 at every turning point in the startup world, there is kind of this new wave of media, either format or the type of people that are creating media. And at each turning point, they were provocative in throwing yesterday's kind of more conservative approach out the door and understanding what people want uh, and what people are interested in today's day and age and kind of took those risks. And now we're just at that next turning point where this is, what, this is where the, the young people are today. And yeah. therefore, uh, you know, this is the type of media organization we can, we can, we think we can build. The startup content of yesterday will not work for the entrepreneurs of tomorrow. Oh, yep. bar. That's a bar. Holy <laughs> and, shit. And, and it has, and it has always been the case. That's the thing is like, this is a, an age old thing. You know, if you think yeah. about like various, various transitions in media. Because I mean, I feel like the OG podcasters right now, they they were established and that was like the new wave of the the entrepreneurs of tomorrow but now the style is kind of becoming outdated and there's this new trend of entrepreneurs coming in that's like i mean we see it on twitter the like informal just like they want to just like have fun just and showcase all the fun that they're making exactly. okay well now we're gonna put your guys's pitching skills to the test and we're and ours we're gonna do a pitch competition it's gonna be all cast x deck doctors basically murph Explain to them what, what, what we about to do. We got a hat full of ideas. Oh, right, yeah. no. I got a hat. And there's three aspects to the pitch. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there's the problem space. And then we're giving, we're randomly, we're random. I randomly generated off chat <laughs> the problem oh, space, the tech, and I like, I kind of corrupted it a little bit. And then the customer. 
Did you so, chat GPT this shit, or is it like some Murph- some is my some is my uh, girlfriend's writings, and then um, <laughs> and then I had to ask chat for some more, I guess. But okay, oh <laughs> yeah. You guys are starting first. You guys start first, then we're gonna go against All you. Right. All Problem right. space is what to do on the weekend. <laughs> That's the problem space. And then the tech you're going to be using to solve this problem. AI chatbot. God damn it. You already know where this is going. We'll see what customer you get. Um, busy mom. Sorry, my handwriting's trash. Oh my God, that's chicken Dude, scratch. They got like, the most traditional, like, this is like busy the most mom. traditional college problem. Let's see him, let's see him kill it. Let's see him kill it. <laughs> problem space, yeah. what to do on the weekend. We're going we to give them, like, a minute or two to collect their ideas, and then we're going to cut it back to when they're ready to pitch. I think it's, I mean, just to play it back, it's like we have busy moms. They have a, they have something, you know, they don't know what to do on the weekends. They're, they're working all week. They're, uh, you know... <laughs> they're they're also so busy during the week that they got to catch up on all sorts of different shit on the weekends and therefore they either need a chatbot assistant or they really just need a friend to vent to or something like yes. that. Uh, <laughs> this is just this is just like spewing friend.com just like, that's what i was gonna yeah. say it's friend. <laughs> like, maybe it, maybe it's maybe this sounds like this is friend.com this is it oh my gosh friend.com is- for the weekends <laughs> Y'all getting ready to start pitch. I know y'all got a little... Let's see what ideas you got spewed up. Alex, you want to do your version or mine? You got it first. I don't know <laughs> if I really have a good version. All right, so I, I'd basically be like, all right, so we're, we're, um, we're the mom bot. Uh, we're off to the races with 400 grand in year one revenue uh, across 5,000 moms, all focused in Connecticut. Uh, there's 50 million moms in the United States. And with the spread of SoulCycle and all these other Pilates oh and yoga studios, <laughs> there's too much to do. Mix in managing the family and mix in television, which is getting better and better. And you literally have a recipe for disaster. 48 hours, thousands of activities. What do you do? Meet the first LLM. <laughs> the, 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 first, the first LLM <laughs> tar- tar- targeted on helping moms. Uh, have a great time locally. Uh, you know, we've we've trained our, we, we train our tech individually on each town that we're in with the local activities. Uh, we 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 get talked to through a um, a handheld device like friend.com. <laughs> so we're always there when you need guidance. Um, and yeah, you know, we have a really strong vision. We're uh, basically moving across the country through a geographic expansion plan. We have a really strong land and expand where we go through Pilates studios and uh, we give out free free LLMs to the, to the members. And then they, they you share get LLM. Their you get an LLM. Yeah. 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 And, and, we, and we do a rev share. We do a rev share with Pilates studios where they actually get 10% of lifetime revenue from each mom. This is too um, good. This and, is you too know, good. Our, our, goal, our goal is the world because the, the, the problems being faced by American moms are being faced by moms in all developed countries. And will be faced by moms in undeveloped countries too in the future. So oh, we believe that this has global potential, and every mom needs a hand uh, to maximize weekend funds and weekend plans. That is crazy. Well, the- <laughs> <laughs> that was the craziest. Like you had all the metrics there. You had everything. Oh my gosh! <laughs> all right, let's uh, let's do the next one. Uh, all right. You different way. You can try a different way, uh, you try a different way or do, do you want us to go? Okay, you guys go. I can't do any better than that. that was... Get the hat. Oh, get the yes. hat going. Get the hat going. God oh, damn it. <laughs> I don't even know how to fucking follow that up. Oh, bro. No, no. Don't worry. Don't worry. Unconventional. All right. We got like online shopping misfits. So is that like uh, what, what would you like, guys decide? You can't. You like shit that you order online doesn't fit when you actually get it delivered. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Like returns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a hard one. Damn. Fuck. Alex, know. get ready. Virtual reality. Alex, That's our tech. Virtual off. reality? Virtual That's, reality. That's light work. That's light work. All right, all right. That's light work. And then we got uh, Rave Fiend. I spelled it like Playboy, but Rave Fiend. <laughs> what? That's what what is we're that? stopping it for? Oh, fiends? Fiends. <laughs> like yeah, ravers? Rave Fiends. Yeah, just Ravers. 
Raver. My <laughs> Raver. <laughs> all, right, wait, so all right, all right. Ravers, they can't fit into the clothes that they got in virtual reality? Yeah. Good luck, Alex. Go. Yeah. <laughs> no, nah, they're going. Uh, no, we're doing this. We're doing, we're doing this. this. We'll do all this. We'll do this. Let's see it. Uh, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna think about something. All right. So while we were thinking, Mark helped us, and we're gonna take that help. But I'm gonna take all the credit for it. So it wasn't Mark's <laughs> idea. Uh, but like immersive experience. Mark Zuckerberg is backing us with his uh, uh oh what is it the the OS his OS uh, Meta OS Meta OS. And he told us that this was the best idea he's come across using the metaverse. Basically, <laughs> think about this. You know, we struggle finding the right fits for raves. Finding the right fits to just really show up to everyone and really show them out. You know what I'm saying? Like when I go to a rave, I want everyone looking at me and telling that I got. I want to be snapping necks. I want to be snapping necks. I want to be snapping (laughs) necks. Exactly. So what do we did? We created a VR immersive experience where it throws you in that fit in the rave and it'll simulate people snapping their necks. So we'll give you our LLM. We'll give you a score in that virtual reality, and based on that, our NPCs will decide if they will snap their neck or not based on if you're walking in. <laughs> <laughs> we are, I don't even know what our growth plan is to go to every single rave and we'll do, and I'm taking this from Mark. We're doing revenue sharing. We're doing, we're doing partnerships. We're doing in, influencer marketing. We have unlimited money. So, you know, honestly, we're throwing it at everywhere. We're backed by Mark Zuckerberg. So it don't really matter. So that's my pitch. And we calling it <laughs> the rave Three thousand. Let's go. <laughs> Three thousand. Oh, that was awful. <laughs> fun, fun bit, dude. You Thanks gotta for get, indulging you gotta get in the, that. You gotta get That's the Mark funny. Zuckerberg ad. He's got. He's gotta be. He's gotta be the first tester. You gotta do the product demo. And suck, suck yeah, at no, the we, rave. We put it on next. Twitter. <laughs> he's got the gold chain on, and he's, everyone's just like, oh, "Is that Mark? Is that Mark?" <laughs> immediate, immediate virality. So good. <laughs> All right, well, we want to use the last 10 to talk about some, like, just random shit that's going on in the startup world. Me and Mark were talking about earlier, it was, like, growth strategies. What is, like, the new growth strategy? And I brought up, like, Avi. We we oddly brought up friend, friend.com or friends.com. And I was talking about how he already built the foundation of, like, knowing who he is. And he tried to do something that was crazy that could have been seen as a crazy growth tactic. I, I still don't believe that he actually spent 1.8 million dollars on domain name. There's no way. I don't know that I believe that happened. He did. You don't. You, is that true? Well, we we can talk about it after. But okay, yeah, okay. uh, I have some. I heard something else. But yes. Okay. <laughs> and date, man. I want to talk about. First of all, let's talk about friend.com. Like this is this is like raving recently. All that. I think that he he's a genius in the sense of how he pitched this as like a way to get his name out there. Like now everyone knows who Avi is. And I feel like in the future when he starts raising, it's gonna be light work for him. No, so the so the one so I, I we we recently have been talking with this awesome guy. I'll give him a shout out, Rob from snag.com, who is a uh he is a domain wizard. And oh. we were, I, I don't know if it's like a it's not I think, I think he just kind of maybe surmised, but you know a lot of these big domain purchases are done with a lease to own uh, structure. So he's, you know, you're paying it off over a, a long period of time. Uh, so, you know, in theory, when the big numbers came out where it's like Avi from friend.com spent 1.8 million and had only raised 2.4 million. Uh, in reality, it's probably, it's probable that he's paying that off on a month to month basis and didn't really drain the whole bank account on the, on the domain. That being said, I do think it was a very genius, very, very smart strategy um, for a few reasons that I actually did post on LinkedIn about. So I have a little bit of a framework in mind. Basically, when I first, when I first saw the thing, I saw it on Twitter, I was like, I immediately assumed he was a later stage company. And when I found out that they had only raised 2.4 million, it's like, oh my God, it's even crazier to spend 1.8 million. And basically, what made, all you, think that? What made you think that he was a later stage um, because company? Because who's going to spend 1.8 million? In, and that, that's part of the brilliance of this is who's going to spend 1.8 million if you only have 2 million in the bank. But the, <laughs> the, the interesting thing is, is that, I mean, I personally think <laughs> that he basically looked at it and was like, if I spend 1.8 million on friend.com, it's going to go pretty mega viral and everyone's going to see the pre-order. It's a $100 pre-order, which 
you know, in, in the grand scheme of technology at this stage is very reasonable pricing. Yeah. I can get a, enough impressions and we saw what happened. He's probably got a hundred million impressions at this point for a hundred dollar pre-order. And so instead of having a raise a, a fundraise, you know, go out and talk to VCs and convince them to give them the, him the money to then spend this amount of money on a domain, at which point they probably would have, the VCs themselves probably would have said, no way you're spending 1.8 million. You don't even have a product yet. He said, fuck that. I'm going to spend it. I'm going to, you know, spend it up front, fund the rest of the company, or at least the next year with pre-orders. And then the, uh, the, the side effect of that is now, instead of having to go to VCs and convince them of this concept that people have seen other people try to do now he's got so much attention, they're knocking on his door. So a fundraise that could have taken six months, uh, now is probably at the snap of a finger. If he wants to raise, you know, 10 million, or he wants to raise a you know, traditional large seed round or a large series A round. He's yeah, got he's all the traction. The so he just basically skipped to the end of the intended goal of funding this company with pre-orders and what's most likely investors just clamoring at his door. So that's why I think it was just a huge swing. Of course, it could have gone the wrong way, yeah, but it are. seems seems to have played out in a very, a very you know, effective way. I mean, what do you guys think the best growth strategy is for like anybody? I mean, like I have my opinion on this is the is that grassroots and being able to really really get a following that just loves you like loves the co-founders loves the product and it's just like they get excited just being around you being around the innovation which is very hard to do but it's very 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 sustainable i don't know if i have like a one best tactic because i think at the end of the day it really just is do you understand your customer and what's going to mm -hmm. capture their attention and so uh, that that that's what I would go with. It's hard to it's hard to say one tactic is better than so, another. So, so, something customer. that comes to mind for me, because just to narrow it in, I guess is I think like a lot of a common ground between great companies that market really well and spark communities quickly is like a really unique channel. Like like right off the bat, they're not just doing Instagram. They're not just going everywhere with their stuff. It's like you know they start some run club or like. Let's say you were a company that was focused on uh, like smocks and like shit for people who are cooking. Like maybe you would start like a local pottery group and get everyone who's like doing like, like you know what I'm saying? It's like you, like you create some like yeah, weird local you. group and get everyone like super into your product. And yeah. I feel like that's just a common trend. Like I've seen all these running brands get major by creating running clubs. And I've seen um, and you just see it with a lot of things. So I almost feel like maybe just to, in general, I think I agree. I think community is huge and people expect that they could just start posting stuff on Instagram and people follow the page and that's a community. Um, and it's not even like, it's like before you can even have like the WhatsApps and the Slack channels or whatever, like you need, you need like a really, really core group of people. Um, but to do that, you need like a minimum lovable product, which is a concept yeah. I love to think about which is a minimum viable product is great to validate an idea, but to actually do what we're talking about, like you need something that's likable or lovable. So I feel like that's kind of the, the, the book for me. It's validate something with something that's viable, then create something that like the very biggest fans could love and then just like be with them for a, a while. And it might just be 10 people who like it, but like, yeah. that, 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 that to me is the core of like a lot of great products. Your focus needs to be 1000% on making an excellent product that makes money. And we talk to people who are making pitch decks and they get focused on the pitch deck. But look, at the end of the day, like there is nothing more important than actually just like selling your shit. Selling, say sell, that, like say that. selling something great. That is the number one thing in your head. And to do that, you need to be good at making something great and you need to be good at selling it. But like that is goal number one, sell something great. I love it. I think it's uh, I think it's somewhat reminiscent of just like make that first dollar. I think a lot of people just kind of like, you know, will will wait too long. They'll they're they're trying to kind of concept things for so long, and we were in the same boat. And I think it's I think it's make something great, and then you know make that first yeah. dollar. The other thing I'd say just for people on the founder journey, I don't know if Mark can agree with this, but I think it's I think it's just the nature of uh, embracing discomfort on a day-to-day -day basis uh and enjoying that yeah thank you guys for hopping on how can this they get, an awesome get in contact with you guys if there's people a builder what's social like what things what's the best platform to reach you guys how Some do we socials get, 
everything. How do we, how's everyone get in contact with you? Um, techdocs.com. That's it. And we got, and then we have the LinkedIn and we have our personal and, LinkedIn's that we post and their, on. And the podcast. You guys tune into their podcast. They, they have, have like a little, channel, the, yeah. the YouTube channel. Honestly, have an amazing day, y'all. I hope y'all enjoyed this little journey while we were being curious. And thank you to Alex and Mark for getting on here. We'll catch you guys on the next time. Thank you guys.